we're going to continue our series on foundations, which is what we've been working through, foundations of us as a church. And we're going to look at the fruit of Jesus' three-year ministry on earth, what he poured his life into and what he left behind to continue, which presumably should be quite foundational, I would think, for us as a church. As good evangelical Protestants, our mind jumps to the Bible, doesn't it? But of course, Jesus didn't write this. He didn't leave a book at all. What he left was a community. What he poured his life into was that group of 120 who met in the upper room. He did the first church plant. <laughs> First prototype church. He spent three years pouring his life, his teaching into these 120. And what he left to continue the mission was people. Now out of those people came the book, the living active word of God on which we base our lives and transforms everything. But it's good to remember that Christianity is essentially, we call it incarnational. Just as God came as a man to live all of this sort of life so he continues always to make his truth through people and in people so what we're going to look at today is community because community is the heart of the gospel the gospel is all about reconciliation and about building a community and creating a new community and of course god is utterly relational the trinity which is we can't really get our heads around god the father god the son god the holy spirit three persons but one are in perfect unity and relationship is what god does it's the heart of who he is the bible doesn't talk much about individual christians actually hardly at all it always talks about a relationship it talks about a body. It talks about how we were members of one another. Now that's quite a powerful phrase, isn't it? So we're going to try and unpack it a bit today. And we, we need to stand back and just recognise that in our culture, we've come a long way from this. This is not natural for us. If you were to go to a different culture, um, I'm told this is true in China, there is no word for me. The word is, there's a whole raft of words. One is me and my family. One is me and my friends. One is me and my workmates. It's always defined in respect to other people. In Africa, they have this wonderful word, Ubuntu, uh, in different, comes slightly different, different languages. And what it means, in essence, is I am who I am through other people. Some good nods. <laughs> Our relationships are part of who we are. In our Western world, we've become so far down the line of looking inwards for who we are. Our identity is inwards. We've lost what most of the world still understands as biblical truth, that our identity is also outwards. It's in our relationships. We are who we are through others around us, not just what's happening inside us. And we're going to be looking at that today. I think if we're honest here at this stage of our life of community, our experience of this varies quite a lot. For some of us, community in Trinity is really working well. We've got time to see each other, we meet up in the week, our lifestyles and situations fit. But for many of us, it's much harder. We're in different places different geographies, different stages of our lives. So I think this is quite a challenge for us. Even if you are in central London and do meet up with a bunch of people from your community group, which is great, that's only the start point because it's then about reaching out to those that can't easily get there. They don't have the money, they live a bit further away, or their lifestyle of work is different. How do we reach out and build community broader than that. It, it's interesting, the Bible doesn't talk much about the word community. 
And I think if you think about it, life in the early church, where the majority of members were slaves, and so worked every day, and were lucky if they could get an evening off a week, then it was probably quite difficult for them as well. Maybe actually our experiences and our challenges are not very different from the early church. Mm. And maybe we should see ourselves as we go through the Bible today, we're going to dig into how they, we're going to do a biblical journey, dig into how they worked on relationship and see whether we can learn from that ourselves. The passage read at the beginning will come to at the end, so just park that for the moment. So what the Bible talks about is not community, it is a word called koinonia, which means fellowship. So you'll find the word fellowship frequently through the New Testament. You won't find the word community hardly ever. Koinonia means a sharing in something. The Greek word is used for marriage. So marriage is a koinonia of life, where you're sharing in life together. If you're in a business partnership, it's a koinonia of work. So the word fellowship is almost always used in connection with something else. It doesn't stand on its own. It used to be churches used to call themselves a fellowship. I don't know whether you've come across that or, or the fellowship. It's not what the Bible says. You can't have the word on its own. It's always a fellowship in something. So let me give you some examples. It can be a fellowship in mission. Philippians 1 verse 4, Paul says, I always pray with joy because of your fellowship in the gospel from the first day to now. In other words, we share the gospel. We share the impact the gospel has on our lives. And we do that sometimes, don't we, on WhatsApp by sharing verses. And we share in taking the gospel to a world that desperately needs it. That's fellowship. In the New Testament, fellowship is often in suffering. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 7, we know that just as you fellowship in our sufferings, so you also fellowship in our comfort. Philippians 4 14, Paul says, thank you for fellowshipping in my troubles. One of the richest fellowships is in our challenges, our sufferings. Sometimes they're hard to share with each other, but actually that's where fellowship happens. That's what our groups, and we'll touch on community groups as we go through this, that is a place where it's safe to share our sufferings and therefore experience koinonia and fellowship. It also often in the New Testament often means sharing material things. Hebrews 13, 16 says, do not forget to do good and to share, to fellowship with others for which with such sacrifices God is pleased. Our sharing of possessions, our sharing of our homes is fellowship. Again, something not easy to work out how to do, but we can. And as we do that more and more, we will experience this thing called fellowship which is actually more fundamental than community and deeper and longer lasting. But fundamentally, fellowship is about sharing in our common experience of the goodness and grace of God. It's what we did this morning, wasn't it? God met us in a very intimate way and invited us to share together in his goodness and his love and in his grace. Again, that's what we do when we gather together on Sundays. That's what we do when we gather together in groups. It's interesting. Most of the promises in the Bible are not singular. They are plural. We tend to think of them as, oh, this is a promise for me today. Actually, they're nearly always written as you plural. They're a promise to us as a people. And as we gather together, the promises become more real. Thank you. So 2 Peter 1 verse 4, through these he's given us his great and precious promises so that through them you, plural, may participate, may fellowship, the word is koinonia, in the divine nature. What an amazing promise. That through these promises he, we can fellowship in a shared experience of who God is. John at the beginning of his first letter says, 
And this is lovely, I love this bit, because this is John talking about his experience of being with Jesus. He says, we proclaim to you what we've seen and heard. And earlier on, he talks about touched and felt. This was one of those people who was with Jesus, that 120 men and women for those three years. We proclaim to you what we've seen and heard so that you might have koinonia, fellowship with us. So our fellowship grows as we talk about what we know about Jesus. And our fellowship, our koinonia, is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. This is not just community as we know it. This is something far deeper, far more precious, and actually far more challenging. <laughs> bishop Leslie Newbigham, who was a pioneer mission bishop in India um, in the last century and wrote some very good stuff, says, Christianity in its very heart and essence is not a disembodied spirituality, but life in a visible fellowship. He uses the word fellowship again. A life that makes such claims on us and so engages our energies that nothing less than the closest and most binding association of men and women with each other can serve its purpose. It's a big calling, this. It's a big calling. So fellowship is not a church activity. It's not a trendy word or a name for a church. It is the heart of the gospel. And it's a demonstration that God himself is relational at the core of his being. It's interesting. We have um, worked on creating our mission statement and it's, you may or may not have heard it yet. I'm just gonna give it to you because um, we're gonna come back to a second. Our mission as Trinity is to make kingdom-minded disciples we're focusing not on members or converts, but disciples who give themselves to pursuing the presence of God, inviting people back to God and working for the good of London. So you will keep hearing that. But there's a challenge to that. Because what did Jesus say was the test of discipleship? He said, by this you shall know that they are my disciples that they love one another. So actually underlying all those three is something else. If we want to make disciples, we, and we want to be disciples, we need to be people who love each other deeply. Because according to Jesus, that is the first test of discipleship. What sort of love is it? Our society is full of talking about love, isn't it? Romantic love, Love Island, that's not that. All sorts of other versions of love. In fact, it's elevated into something unreal, I think, really. This is not that sort of love. We talk sometimes about unconditional love. And it does include that. But you know, it's something far more than unconditional love. Because unconditional love at the end of the day is passive. It accepts everything, but it doesn't go outwards towards people, does it? That's why it's quite popular in society, because it's tolerant. Now this is, the Bible talks about something far, far more than that. Though it includes accepting each other. It talks about sacrificial love. And we sang that, and we saw that. It's a sacrificial love that reaches out to people yes. and serves them. In John 15, 13, Jesus said, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than he laid down his life for his friends. What a verse. I've read that many times, but studying this, I thought, blow, that is something. Love. It's a command, first of all. Jesus doesn't give many commands. I sort of thought we were past commands, but no, actually, there's some commands in the New Testament. And at the end of Matthew 28, he says, go and make disciples and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. So there's some weight to this. Love each other as I have loved you. What a standard. <laughs> I mean, how on earth do we get close to that? 
A greater love has no man than this, than he lay down his life for his friends. And you read it again in 1 John 3, 16 and, and Thessalonians. That verse is used sometimes for the great sacrifice and sort of changed into people who die for each other. But that's not what he means. This isn't talking about one-off things. This is daily. This is greater love has no man than this, than he lays his life down Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday etc for his friends of course we can't do this well I can't I don't know about you but this is beyond what I am able to do the busyness of life gets in the way the effort just needed to go and see each other when we live so far apart the different lifestyles and backgrounds that make it difficult are hugely challenging to do this so how do, we, how do we do this? I think the answer is found in a very familiar verse at the end of 2 Corinthians. And you'll all know it well when I say it. This is how Paul ends the letter. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Packed into this short verse is everything we need to empower us and enable us to share our lives with each other in the way that Jesus commanded us in real fellowship. Three things, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've experienced that today in worship, haven't we? This complete acceptance of who you and I are today, without any frowns, without any judgment, just an easy, uncomplicated, warm friendship with the Lord of the universe. The grace that means every day we receive totally undeserved forgiveness, joy, peace. Don't, don't deserve any of it. It doesn't matter what we've done or not done. Grace is what Jesus gives to us every day. That is the source of being able to love each other. But then so is the love of God, our Heavenly Father. It is as we experience his love that we love each other. I've been reading 1 John, um, which is a book we don't often go to, but is an enormously powerful book about this. I'm just gonna read you some verses from 1 John 4. And if you wanna go home and read one thing from this, I suggest 1 John 4, or even the whole book of John. Because this is, this is Gem, this is the guy who was there <laughs> from the beginning, called by Jesus, lived those three years, went on and lived a life for about ooh, 50, 60 years probably. And this is what he's writing at the end of his life. And this is what he says. This is how he distills. This is how he sums up what he learnt. He says, dear friends, let us love one another, for love is from God. That's the source. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. S dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought, ought to love one another. God is love. It's a very powerful statement, isn't it? God is love, that's his essence. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. We love because he first loved us. Amen. If you want to love people more, the only way I've found to do it is to ask God to give me more of his love. Because <laughs> that changes us. And that enables, it's not that we use that love to love other people, no. As we experience being loved, we are able to love. And then finally, interestingly, it's koinonia, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. God himself wants to fellowship with us whenever we gather together and on our own so that we can fellowship with each other. We receive the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. We talk a lot about what he does and gives us, his gifts, his fruits, and he does. And, and you know, I think we should be talking more about him and what he gives. But here is something very special that he gives us, a fellowship with God and with each other. It's very similar when you read that bit at the beginning of Philippians 2, 
that passage that leads on to Jesus humbling himself and talks about how we should relate well to each other it starts off with with almost exactly the grace but in action this bit we were reading it says if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ if any comfort from God's love if any fellowship with the Spirit same combination of three things that then enable us to be different with each other this is from my experience a loving accepting church but I think we've still got some way to go it's still possible to be lonely here it's still possible to feel isolated here partly because of circumstances maybe maybe just maybe as we let these truths sink into us and meditate on them they will bear fruit of a persevering determined self-sacrificial love and we can build something beautiful here because that's what london needs to see above all is a group of people who genuinely love each other whatever their backgrounds whatever their situations wherever they live and i'm just for a few minutes now going to talk about what this looks like in practice we're going to land into something practical because the bible is always very helpful and practical and within the new testament there are over 50 one another's phrases where it says do this to one another or for one another and they give us a picture of what fellowship looks like can anyone think of any just to make sure someone's awake out there any phrase about something one another <laughs> you know them it's just a question of coming back to mind love well that's a good start yes <laughs> the clue was in the message love one another yeah any others pray for one another comes in encourage. encourage thank you Craig let me start running through them of the 50 17 I love one another interesting isn't it it's the foundation for everything else it was it's not surprising when it is the commandment of Jesus that the disciples carried this through love one another love one another it's in every letter in, in it's with every with Paul with with James with John everybody love one another in fact it spells it out a bit more love one another deeply from the heart that's 1 Peter 3 verse 8 love one another deeply from the heart that's a love that's deeply rooted that doesn't come and go with our feelings that's the sort of love I want for you lot <laughs> um, a love that is deep that is rooted in our hearts it's a love about devotion Romans 12 verse 10 be devoted to one another in brotherly love I want to become more devoted I want us to become more devoted to each other it's part of the reason why we haven't done this great explosive massive church growth it's because God wants to build something special here and something beautiful 1 Thessalonians 3 verse 12 talks about how God can help our love increase and overflow for each other maybe look that one up 1 Thessalonians 3 verse 12 it's a promise that the love of God will help our love increase and overflow for each other so that's the first most frequent the second there are then three others that come four or five times and we'll just go through them briefly the first is to build up and encourage encouragement is key encouragement is the lifeblood of fellowship 1 Thessalonians 5 11, encourage one another and build each other up Hebrews 3.13, encourage one another daily. Maybe we can use things like our WhatsApps with a real focus on let's encourage one another because encouragement releases and builds fellowship. Almost the same number of times we get another group of instruct, teach, admonish and spur on. It's interesting. We've got encouragement on one side but equally with it is challenge this challenging each other to be the best disciples we can be 
Colossians 3.16. Let the word of God dwell in you richly as you would teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And the lovely one, Hebrews 10.24. Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us consider, let's consider this morning, who can you spur on to love and good deeds? Because the Bible says we can do that. And as we think about it, I think things will come to our minds. There's a, there's a bit of challenge and stirring here as well. And then the other one is, honour one another, submit to one another, be humble with one another. Romans 12 verse 10, honour one another above yourselves. Ephesians 5 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. An honouring community is an amazing place. I've seen it in some places where they go overboard and I think actually it's probably worth going overboard for, where they clap and cheer each other. Not sure we could quite pull that one off here. But honouring one another publicly and being humble and considering Philippians 2 verse 3, in humility consider others better than yourselves and submit to one another. This is mutual submission throughout. We're, we're talking about creating a leadership team of elders and then other teams, but this is all submitted to each other. This is all about service. This is not about authority. This is about love in action. We're also encouraged to forgive each other, pray for each other, bear with each other's faults, carry each other's burdens. Have a look through the one another's. Maybe in groups when we finish the prayer course, we'll come back and look at this because this is the, this is the fuel, this is the practicalities. This is the, okay, what can I do to love that person? Well, there's 53 hints. 17 of them are about loving each other. Practically, one of the best ways to work this out is because we have community groups. We're too big a group to always do this on Sunday. So we encourage everyone to be a member of a community group. We have three at the moment, one in central London, one in the sort of Penge area, one in the Bromley area. They're a place to practice this. In fact, I think, I think it's very hard to grow in this if you're not a member of one. Now that is different for different people because getting to them can be different. And we need to be a bit more creative about how we can take group to you if you can't easily get to group. Um, but they are the core of where we're going to learn to put this in practice. And when people say to me, what's community group about? I say it's, I always say it's about two things. People will come for two reasons. They'll come if they know they're loved and welcomed. And they'll come if they know God's going to turn up at some point. I don't care how or when. It may be in the, in the talking, it may be in the praying, it may be in the worship. But if those two things happen, you've got a great community group. Because that will then spill over. And that's what we're trying to create here with each other. So that was, a, that was an encouragement for community groups. Because practically, I think they're where we work this out first and foremost. So if you're not part of one, or the one you work just doesn't work for you, come and talk to me and we'll see if we can create something else. We want to create more groups. Because of this whole geography thing, we need to do that. So we're open to any ideas about how we can do this differently. I'm going to come now to that passage that Nikki read. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ Welcome to you for the glory of God. That is our theme tune, isn't it? To see the glory of God. How are we going to see it? By welcoming and loving one another. It's come full circle, right round to what we feel God's called us to do. So here, I think, is the biblical description of a prototype community. <laughs> or a prototype church trying to live out community. It is a place where everyone, irrelevant of background, personality, intelligence, resources, knows they are deeply loved. It is a place where everyone feels honoured, encouraged, 
instructed and challenged to be the best disciple of Jesus they can be. And it's a place where forgiveness is quick and genuine, where burdens are shared and no one need feel judged. Let's stand. So the question is, is this the sort of community you and I are prepared to invest our time, energy, gift and resources in building? I'm not going to ask for <coughs> hands up or a response, but that's the question God's asking us. Is this the sort of community you and I are prepared to invest our time, energy, gifts and resources in building? In short, are we prepared to lay our lives down for each other daily? Is that the journey we want to be on? Is that the command we want to fulfill? We can only do it. We love because he first loved us. What we're going to do now is share communion together. Break bread together. I think it's the only way we can really respond to this. I don't want to do an upbeat song because this isn't that sort of thing. This is something to take away in your heart and meditate on and think, can I do this? Because it's hard. I'm not pretending it's easy, particularly in our situation. It will take driving across London sometimes. It will take spending an hour to go and see someone for half an hour. It will take reaching out to people you don't naturally get on with and paying for them to come with you to the cinema. It will take laying our lives down creatively. But I think as we experience as we've done this morning the love of God we'll find we can do it so let's just together say the grace that passage I read because I think in that as we said is the heart of this so we'll just say this together may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and always so father we ask you that you would pour out your love on us that would enable us to love each other. We want to be like that first community baptised into love who deeply cared for each other and as a result transformed the world around them. So Father, would you come? I pray that you put seeds in our hearts from today that in the weeks and months ahead will produce good fruit I pray that your word is living and active for us. I pray most of all that whenever we come together, we will know your love and be able to express it more to each other. Amen.